Yeah, a little bit of a different service. We've been walking through uh, the book of Romans uh, for the past little while, and last week we took a bit of a detour, and uh, as such, this week we're going to take a little bit of a detour as well. Uh, last week we, we talked um, and uh, we talked and prayed and, and trusted and, and hoped um, that God would touch Peter and uh, in his physical illness and his physical sickness um, that he would heal him. And, and it was a wonderful, wonderful service. We even had an opportunity at the end to pray for many of you and uh, trust that God would heal and take away that infirmity and make you uh, make us whole again. And so we find ourselves coming to uh, the scriptures this morning with a bit of a different question on our hearts and on our minds. What happens when God doesn't heal? I think it's a valid question. I think it's a fair question. And I think it's one that the church needs to wrestle with. I think it's one that we need to wrestle with. And we need to kind of wrap our minds around and and, uh, walk through it as a church family and uh, see what the Lord would have to say to us. I'd like to open up by telling, uh, just re- recanting a story that I, uh, I came across a few, uh, maybe about a month, month and a half ago. There's a church out in Redding, California called Bethel. Uh, big, charismatic church. You probably heard a lot of their music. We sing some of their music here on stage. Um, they just love Jesus. They're passionate about the things of the Spirit. And um, uh, about a month and a half ago, reports came out that one of their worship leaders, they have multiple worship leaders, and one of their worship leaders, um, all of a sudden, reports came out that their two-year-old, uh, I think it was daughter, um, just died. Suddenly, just died. Uh, no if, ands, or buts, it just, it just happened. And this news hit the Bethel community like you wouldn't believe. Well, I actually, we would believe because we, we can somewhat understand what they're going through. Um, and that church... Uh, they, uh, they gathered together, and, and just as we as a church gathered together, they, they gathered together and they began to pray. They began to storm the gates of heaven. They began to just seek the Lord, and, and, and they began to pray not for healing, but they began to pray for a uh, miraculous resurrection. And it was just amazing watching this church come together. And then, you know, they would have special worship nights. They would have special messages. That, you know, for the next three to four days, they gathered together and they began to pray like they've never prayed. They began to believe like they'd never believed uh, for the resurrection of this little girl. Now, what's interesting about this is in order to understand this story fully, you need to understand some of the backstory. Because they didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, let's pray for resurrection. Uh, a year before that happened, there was another worship leader. This didn't really make the news as much, but uh, a year before this incident, there was another worship leader in the Bethel Church in Redding, California, who um, uh, one of their kids became deathly ill uh, with some strange, unknown virus bug. They had no idea what was going on. Uh, that kid went to the hospital, and then um, I believe it was the, the son, and then the daughter. And these are only single, you know, digit aged kids. Then the daughter went in and got the same bug, went to the hospital, and the doctors are scratching their heads. They're like, "We have no idea what's going on with these kids, but their numbers are falling and falling and falling." They were calling the family in, saying. We don't know what's going on, but it's time to, you know, you're going to have to prepare yourselves for what looks like the inevitable at this stage of the game. And so the church, they gathered together. They began to pray. They began to seek heaven, seek the Lord, and they began to pray for a miracle. They began to pray that the Lord would give the the doctors wisdom, insight, and discernment. They began to pray that they would open their eyes and ears to understanding what's going on with these kids. They just began to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And within a week, both of those kids hopped and jumped and strolled out of that hospital like nothing had ever happened to them before. So you see, when this worship leader and their daughter died at two years old, when they prayed, They were praying for a miracle. They were hoping with expectation because of what they had experienced the year before. They had every reason to believe that God would do it again. We sing songs like that, Pastor Steve. God, would you do it again? Would you do it again? And their prayer at that moment was, God, would you do it again? 
Would you move in your miraculous power so that this little girl would rise from the dead? And what an amazing witness, what an amazing testimony this would be, not only for the Christian community, but for the community at large in Redding, California, and the world even beyond that. You see, in our minds, we all thought, this, this is, this is going to happen. Day one, they prayed. Day two, they prayed. Day three, they prayed. And finally, in desperation on day four, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. But resurrection to that little girl never came. And instead of holding this wild, God-glorifying and honoring party for the world to see what God has done, this young mother and father had to walk through the funeral process and bury their two-year-old child. heartbreaking. A number of years ago, I was youth pastoring in Oakville. And um, it was at the end of the service and a lady came up. I, ha- I just happened to be preaching that Sunday. A lady came up and she asked that I could pray for her. I said, absolutely. I'll pray for you. No problem. Let's pray. Put my hand on her shoulder and I just, as I do, which is normal practice, can I put my hand on your shoulder? Sure, no problem. Put my hand on her shoulder, and I just began to pray. It was a short prayer, maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half. Sometimes prayers can be really long in that instance, but this was just a short prayer, a minute and a half. I didn't feel anything. There was no heat. There's no electricity. There was, uh, there, there was really nothing physically that I, you know, could see or sense that was going on. I was just... I was just praying for this lady, and, and I don't even remember what the need was, but it was, it was probably some family need or something of, of that nature. She thanked me for the prayer, went back to her seat. At the end of the service, she came up to me wild-eyed, oh, like the best kind of panic in her voice, and said, you're never going to guess what happened. I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, well, when you were praying for me, You have no sweet clue, but my shoulder is just completely seized up. Doctors have said that it's done. It's, uh, you know, there's no hope for it. I get a cortisone shot just to deal with the pain, but the movement, the mobility, there's just nothing there anymore. I I could just raise it up a little bit, but that was it. Josh, I want you to see what I'm doing right now. She began to lift her arm, her shoulder, all 360 degrees and everything. And I'm looking at her and I'm like, this is absolutely amazing. I don't even remember what I was praying for you for, but it certainly wasn't healing for your shoulder. Yet in that instant, in that moment, the Holy Spirit reached down from heaven and there's no other way to explain it, but he touched her shoulder, he made her well, he healed her, he did what the doctors were unable to do, God healed her shoulder. So let's ask an incredible difficult question, should we? Why would God heal those worship leaders' kids a year ago? but not raise this one from the dead. Why would he heal those kids for all the world to see is amazing, amazing, amazing. And then a year later, when he had opportunity to do the same thing even greater, why would he let that one slip through the cracks? Why would God heal a seemingly insignificant shoulder through a guy that didn't even know what he was praying for Yet he wouldn't heal Peter. And that same guy was praying for him, doing all the right things. And this time knew what he was praying for. Why would God allow healing to flow through that situation into a shoulder, but not into a set of lungs? Why, when It's one person praying, yet we've got hundreds of people praying. Why was that request granted? Yet this one, not. Begs the question. Here we go. What do we do when God does not heal? 
tough question. I don't even want to talk about this. Like, I don't. Like, nothing within me wants to be here this morning talking to you about this. Everything in me wants to be here saying, look what God did. I was so hopeful after last Sunday, and I know you were too. And I know Joyce was too. We were so hopeful that God was doing this great thing. And so I was so excited to be able to come to you and say, you know, and jo- Joyce was planning on being here. She's like, if his numbers get to this level, then I'm going to be there on Sunday. I'm going to rejoice and celebrate with you. None of us expected this. None of us wanted this to go this way. And I, and I don't still right now want to be here walking you through this. But we must. We must. We must ask the question, what do we do when God does not heal? Another way to ask that question if you're not dealing with healing right now would be, what do we do when what we've prayed for, the answer is not what we hope for? And I've wrestled with this. Man, I have wrestled with this all week long. I've asked, I'm like, God, did I not pray hard enough? Did I, did I not anoint with oil the right way? Did I not bring the right people down with me to pray? Did I not pray? Did, did I pray for healing too late in the game? Should, should I have been there earlier praying and, and, and for healing? Should I have embraced the church family right on the 22nd, 23rd of December when stuff started to go down? Did I not take this seriously enough? In the Was my faith too weak? Was it not great enough? Did I not do the right things? Did I not hold enough prayer meetings? Should we have gathered the whole church together and prayed for 24 hours? Like my mind, and that's my wife. It's just eating me up inside. What did I do wrong? Where did I miss the boat on this one? What can I learn for next time? Interesting thing about that series of questions is it's all me and self-focused, isn't it? It's all me, me, me. What did I do? What did I do? What did I didn't do? What did I should have done? Shoulda, woulda, coulda. First thing I want you to see today here is that God controls the miraculous, not us. We talked a little bit about this last week. God is the author of all life. He is the finisher of all life. He is the only one that can perform miracles. He is the only one that gives life. He's the only one that takes life. He is the author and the finisher. And if you were with us last week, we talked a little bit uh, about the similarities between salvation and healing, that both are controlled and administered by God and God alone. You need to know that there is absolutely nothing that you can do to save yourself. You are absolutely 100%, I am absolutely 100% powerless to save my soul. This is why God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, because that was the only way. A sinful being cannot pay for the price of his sins. Uh, It had to be a sinless being. And so the only way that you and I can be here, can breathe, can live, the only way we can acquire salvation is not anything we can do. We are powerless to do. Only he is powerful and able and willing to do it. If there was something that you and I could do to gain and to acquire our salvation, if we could earn our salvation, then we would inherently have opportunity to boast about it. And this is... It goes against the grain of anything that God teaches us about who he is and, and the nature of our God, our creator. In the same way, we look at healing. And healing is the same deal. There is no secret formula. There's no quadratic equation to make certain that healing happens in a certain situation. It is in God's hands and in his hands Alone. So when we begin to think things like, did I not pray hard enough? Did I not fast long enough? Did I not do the right things? Did I not have enough faith? We need to squash those thoughts immediately because healing has really nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. Because if it has something to do with us, then that little girl would have been raised because they did all the right things. 
They did every right thing. And, 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 and if healing was controlled by us, then that girl with the shoulder would not have been healed because I wasn't even praying for her shoulder. Do you see how it's not about us, but it's every bit about Jesus Christ and his power. He uses us to pray for things. He uses us and his word teaches us and he gives us instruction to pray for healing and, and all these great things. We talked about that last week, but ultimately, God does the healing. It's him and him alone. Ultimately, his will will be done and not ours. See, last week I was praying. I'm not sure if you got this, but I was praying and hoping that our will was aligning with God's will. Do you remember that? I was praying desperately because at that moment, I, I don't know what God's will is, but I'm hoping and trusting and believing that just as much as we see in the natural realm that Peter needs to live, those lungs need to breathe, I'm hoping and believing that God sees the same thing that we see. But the problem, the challenge with that is that we can never align our views uh, or, or God's views with our views. We always have to align our views with God's. That's why we pray, God, your will be done, not ours. Matthew 6, verses 9 to 10 teaches us in the Lord's Prayer that our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe that we could have done all those things. We could have done late night meetings. We, we, we could have, we could have, man, we, we could have put together a whole, you know, uh, a whole, I, I, don't, I don't know, like a whole uh, conference on, on, on praying for this guy. But at the end of the day, God's plan was to take him home. His will, his desire, was to say, hey, Pete, come on home, buddy. You've done what I've given you to do. You've accomplished what I've enabled you to do, what I've empowered you to do. I've got more jobs for you up here. It's time for you to come home. And this is an incredibly difficult reality to grasp that sometimes God heals some people and other times he doesn't heal them the way we want or expect it. And, and, and the minute we try and wrap our minds around this is the minute it, it just, oh, it, we, we, we can just start going in circles and spinning and spinning and spinning. But ultimately it comes down to God's will and his plan. So consider this example from John chapter 5. John shares the story in John chapter 5. You can turn there if you want, but I'll, I'll just give you the close notes of the version. Uh, John shares the story of a specific pool at the uh, temple in Jerusalem. And this pool, multitudes, it says multitudes of sick, blind, leprous, paralyzed people would gather there in hopes that the, the belief, the tradition spoke that an angel would come down uh, at an appointed time and stir the water. And that when that happened, the first person that would enter into the water after it had been stirred, that person would be healed. And so the story goes on. The multitudes are hanging around this pool, waiting for this angel to come down and stir the water. And there's at the edge of the gate, at the, just at the temple gate, waiting there is this completely paralyzed man. And he's just sitting there. And this man has no opportunity to go into that water because there's no one there taking care of him. There's no one there. You know, everyone else is beating him to the punch when that water is stirred and so on and so forth. And What's interesting is that Jesus notices the paralyzed man of 38 years, and he bemoans the fact that he is never able to get into the pool to be first to be healed because he is paralyzed. Jesus has pity on him, and he heals him that instant. And what's interesting about this story is that if you go back into the story, we see a key and an, an interesting thought that at that pool at that time, there were multitudes of people that needed healing. Multitudes. People that had probably been there for years upon years upon years waiting to get into that. People that had probably made pilgrimage after pilgrimage to get into that water to, to have a chance, just to be the chance to be the first to go in there after the angel stirred the water. There, the word teaches us that there were multitudes upon multitudes of people at that well, at that pool. 
We don't know what multitudes means. It could been, mean hundreds. It could mean thousands. The point I'm trying to make to you today is that there were a ton of people at this pool, yet Jesus healed one person. Why would Jesus just heal that paralytic man waiting to get in when all of the other ones needed to be healed? Why does it make any kind of sense that Jesus would just heal one when there were multitudes that needed to be healed ultimately? Healing comes down to God's will and plan, and not ours. He chooses. He, he, he makes the call. And, and, and his will will always supersede our will. And although this is something we will likely never fully understand, we have to understand that ultimately his ways are not our ways. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The minute we try and figure out God is the minute we send our minds into a tizzy, just a downhill spiral. I remember when I was a kid, I would think of eternity. And I would think of, yeah, I'm going to heaven. This is amazing. Uh, I'm I'm never going to die. And my mind would just race. It would just go like, jew, 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 like forever, forever. Have you ever done this? Forever and ever. And and all of a sudden, I'd be getting into this panic attack because I'd be like, I'm going to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And just when I think it's over, ever and ever and ever and ever. And my mind would just go down that road. And I'd be like, I just, I, I, I couldn't fathom eternity because in my mind, there has to be some sort of an end. It just doesn't make sense. Our earthly minds are not meant to understand his infinite ways. Our minds are finite. They're limited to this earth, time, space, and matter. But his mind is infinite. It goes beyond this, and we can never fully, truly understand that because you and I live in the temporal. The minute we try and imagine eternity, we just can't fathom it. Our minds cannot get there because we are so temporally focused because this is our realm. This is our world. But the reality is that this world that you and I live in is but a blip. If we were to look at it as a drop in the bucket of eternity, we're we're looking at like, that. My fingers are clean, don't worry. And, and, and as I'm looking at this, I'm like, this is our reality right now. This is our whole world, but it's nothing. Because eternity awaits us. B- Peter understands that now, but he didn't understand that two days ago. Our minds are so focused on the temporal because we're not meant to understand the infinite eternity. There will be a day, though, like Peter, when we are up in heaven, we will understand as he does. But until that day, it's as if we're looking through a glass darkly. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 to 12 says this, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, a woman, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just uh, as I also am known. You need to understand today that we will never understand why. It's just not going to happen. Why? We aren't meant to understand. Third thing I want you to see here is that this is not our home. And I alluded to this earlier, heaven is our home. Because we are so focused on the temporal, it's hard for us to really understand that, hey, this is just, this is just like, like prepping us for when we get home. How do we know that heaven is our home? Jesus told his disciples this in John 14, 2 to 3, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. When we truly understand that this world is not our home, this life, this temporal existence is but a blip on the screen of eternity, then then we'll be able to grasp eternity a little better even though our minds really can't grasp it. The hope, the trust, the faith comes into play when Jesus' words speak to us and say, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also.
Fourth thing I want you to see here today is that in praying for healing and seeking healing and asking God for the miraculous, the reality is that when we look at the Apostle Paul, is that Paul had a thorn in his flesh. And he had to deal with that for his whole life. Yet Paul would go around and he would pray for healing for others and he, and he would see miraculous things take place through the power of God and anointing of the presence of God flowing through him. Yet he still had a thorn in his flesh. Nobody really knows what that is. You know, theologians have been trying to figure out what's going on, what that was, and so on and so forth, but they don't really know what that was. And we don't really need to know what that was. All we know is that he had some sort of an affliction that he prayed three times for God to deliver him from, yet God chose not to. I can relate to that because when I was a kid, I was prayed for healing for asthma. I remember going to this healing evangelist in Brampton. We went to the theater downtown Brampton. It was like a Sunday night service, special service. I went up to the altar and got prayed for healing. And in that moment, I was told that my asthma was healed. I've been set free and, you know, amazing. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, yeah, this is amazing. This, this is awesome. My, my parents were like, this is, we, we were all, you know, we were all claiming it. We were all there. Yet two days later, when I had an asthma attack and I had to reach for my puffer, you can imagine the incredible guilt that was in my heart when I'm looking at this medicine and I'm like, but God, I'm healed. Yeah, I'm looking at this puffer, I'm grabbing this puffer, but God, I'm healed. And God, you, 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 you healed me. And I had to wrestle with this as a child. My theology, even to this day, uh, as, as far back as yesterday, I called the pharmacy to get a refill on my prescription. Some of you know that there have been some you know, health issues in my life over the past few years, a little while, that I thought were rectified and figured out, but weren't. And so today, I, I, I come before you, and I recognize that in my life, there's a thorn in the flesh that I desperately want God to get rid of. And I'm praying that God removes and gets rid of as far as the east is to the west. But until he does, I recognize that these are things in my life that in some way, shape, or form draw me closer to him. I know it's a weird way to think, but when there's something wrong, you're praying. When there's something challenging, you're seeking him. Oftentimes, we as you know, human beings, when life is perfect and pretty and everything's just going rosy, then our prayer life tanks because there's no real need to pray. As humans, we're, we're, we're like that. We're like little kids. We're, you know, there needs to be a need so that we establish that relationship and work on that relationship for many of us. Not all of us, but many of us. And perhaps in my life, this is an area where God's like, I'm using this so that you will draw near to me. And I know that in Paul's life, that thorn in the flesh existed so that he would draw near to him. He would always cling to him and not take pride in anything that he did on his own. I want you to know today that as we mourn, and as we grieve the loss of our brother Peter Sertic, we do not mourn and we do not grieve as those who are without hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, the maker of heaven, the establisher of life, the giver and taker. Our hope is in him. You see, Peter understands this now with clarity. He gets it. But we have to trust and hope that the Lord Jesus Christ, as he walks us through this, will reestablish in our minds that we do not grieve as those who are without hope. The minute you begin to feel hopeless in your grief, look to the cross. The minute you begin to feel lost and, and just, just empty, look to the cross, pick up your word, and be reminded of the goodness of God. Be reminded that this is not home. He just left this stomping ground a little early. He just left his assignment a little bit earlier. He got to go to heaven. He's rejoicing. We're the ones that are suffering. It's okay to grieve and to worship God in the same breath. I need you to hear that. It's not either or. Today, your grief and your worship 
we meld them together because we are created to worship God. So as you grieve, as you ask God tough questions, and as you don't get the answer that you want, don't let it worship, ruin your worship because you and I are created to worship him. That's everything that comes out. So yeah, you're gonna question, that's fine. You can question him. You, you, you wanna cry out to him, you wanna get frustrated, you wanna get angry, you wanna get mad, that's okay. But do not let it ruin your worship. You wanna, you wanna get it all out, get it all out before God. He's a big guy, he's got great big shoulders, he can carry that burden, that's, that, that's no problem for him. But do not, Compromise your worship, for you and I are created to worship him. And we worship him in the good seasons, and we worship him in the difficult seasons. We worship him today. So when I found out that Peter had passed at 1 a.m. on Saturday morning, my response, through tears in my eyes, I worship you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. For your ways are not my ways. I won't understand, I will never understand, but that's okay because I trust you. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me, they guide me, because for the Christian, death is but a shadow of what would have been if it were not for Jesus Christ. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? It's not here. Not for us. Because there is great hope in our hearts for eternity. And God teaches us that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is with us. Jesus Christ is still on the throne. And although we know that even though he could have healed Peter, yet did not, it does not mean that he is any less powerful or trustworthy. I promise you this one thing, that I will continue to pray with expectation for healing because I know that that is in the word of God. I know that this is what he teaches us. This is what he commands us to do. We're not responsible for the outcome. He is. Our only response is that we go to the throne and we pray for healing. We pray for the sick. We pray for those that need a special touch from God and then we let God do what only God can do. I am not going to stop praying that way. And if it takes a thousand prayers to see one person healed, then I'm gonna pray 10,000 prayers because I wanna see 10 people healed. I'm going to commit to you to keep on praying for healing. It doesn't stop because God decided he wanted someone home more than we wanted them here. As we mourn together, as we move forward, some practical things. Please pray for Joyce. Please pray that God's peace would be all over her. Please pray for the Surtic family, his parents, his, his siblings. They're going through it right now. They're asking these exact questions and they're not gonna get the answer they want. And so we need the Holy Spirit to pour out his peace on them, that he would restore hope, trust, and faith in their lives as they walk through this difficult path, this difficult road. Some of you have asked what are some practical things that we can do. And uh, right now, um, we have set up a GoFundMe account for them. So just look on my Facebook profile, or I think it might be on the Kingsview page. If you want to help, this is a great way to help. Go ahead and click on the GoFundMe and, 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 and help her out. This is, this is going to be a, a very tangible way that you can help her through this grieving process. The crazy thing about grief is that the church really, really does a great job at gathering around and surrounding people for the first week. You know, the church even does a great job at surrounding people through the second week. But what we're gonna need to do as a church family is step into this and over the next month, two months, six months, year, we're gonna need to cover her in prayer. And I, I challenge you, for those of you that pray daily, I hope you all do, would you put her name and would you put her family's name on your prayer list that every day you would take a few moments and pray for them as they walk this road? 
We don't need to pray for Peter anymore. He, he's in heaven now and he's receiving his reward and he's running free. He's jumping over stuff. He's just <laughs> having, he's having a blast. His, his joy is complete. And one day we're going to get up there. We'll run into him and he'll be like, yo, let me show you this. Let me show you this. I got to show you this. I got to go show you this. And, and he'll give us tours. I'm okay with that. Just as long as it's not too soon. Let's pray. In fact, would you stand with me? This might be weird, but I don't care. Um, can you just grab the hand of the person next to you? Right across the um, aisles as well. And um, we're, we're just going to... Yeah, just squeeze in there. That's good. Oh, my mic. Why don't we stand over here? <laughs> and this is just a symbol of unity. That we're standing together. That we're, Joyce, if you're watching this, uh, this is our gift to you. We're just, our, our commitment to you that we're, we're joining together as a body. is your body. Um, and when one of us is hurting, we all hurt. And so together we're going to pray and lift you up before the Lord. So Holy Spirit, we come before you right now. And we lift up Joyce to you right now, Pastor Joyce and, and the whole Surtic family, Lord Jesus. And, and God, we lift up all of the relatives and all of the siblings. And God, we just pray right now that you will be their peace. In the midst of this conflict, in the midst of the raging emotions going on in every single one of their lives, would you reach down from heaven right now and would you be their peace? peace? Would you provide that peace that the world says doesn't exist? Would you provide that peace that says there is hope beyond this life? Our hope is not in this world, but is in the next world. We thank you for Pete. He was such a sweet, 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 gentle man. We thank you for the life, the legacy that he has left behind. God, we pray for uh, Josh and Lily, that Lord, uh, and Jackson, of course, uh, that Lord Jesus, as this uh, pending adoption is, is still in process, that God, nothing will stop this. That God, you will protect all three of those children. And God, we pray that your will be done in this situation, in this scenario. And that uh, Lord Jesus, that process will continue to move forward. Protect their family, Holy Spirit. We give them to you and we commit them to you in all your ways, Lord Jesus. Do what only you can do. We give you the praise, honor, and glory. In your name we pray, amen, amen. amen.